Hey, everybody. I'm here with Luca Basio from Luca Basio Winery and Bella Calle. Hi, Luca. Thanks for joining me. Hi. Hi, everybody. And thanks for, uh, for this time to share with you. So, um, you know, you were born into the wine business. At what, at what point did you know that uh, you wanted to personally pursue it? Well, you know, uh, I, I was born in a wine growing family. So my, uh, my grandfather and grandmother started a wine business in the late 60s in the Piedmont region of Italy. And so since I was very young, uh, I spent all my, all my days, all my weekends too, <laughs> in, in the vineyard, in the winery together with my family. So it, it, it has been such kind of natural uh, steps here by year of, uh, of knowing that wine business and wine uh, would have been my real love in, uh, in lifetime. Obviously, together with my wife. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, so you, uh, well, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so you run, you run two, you run two wineries. Uh, tell me yes. about, like, a little bit about each and about some of the, what distinguishes one from the other. Uh, so, as family, we we've been owing uh, Bosio Winery and Luca Bosio Vineyards here in Santo Stefano Belbo, which is an area between two important wine regions, Lange and Monferrato. Uh, this is the historical winery for our family. And uh, since 2015, we, are, uh, we, we have been involved in Belcolle, Belcolle is a famous and premium winery located in Verduno, which is one of the small villages where Barolo can be produced. And, is the, and then is the place where one of the most iconic and smallest appellation uh, we have in Italy, which is called Pela Verga, Pela Verga from Verduno. Probably almost nobody knows anything about Pella Verga because it's very local and very well known in Italy but there is such a small quantity available that uh, we, we, we neither uh, we never sorry we never uh, try to sell any bottles abroad because we don't have neither for Italian market so uh, but it's interesting and curious that in uh, in a town in a place as Verduno, together with Barolo, another famous appellation can live together. So was was that um, was that tiny appellation sort of a an inspiration for your family to acquire this winery? It was um, first of all, it was a big chance for us because the, um, uh, the previous owner of, uh, of Belcolle um, decided to sell uh, the winery, but only in Piedmont's family. So even if they had the chance to sell to uh, other families, other corporation, other uh, kind of opportunity, they decided to, to sell only to a Piedmontese family because they really wanted to save and protect all the heritage, all the wines, all the uh, tradition created and grown into the winery in the, in the years. So for us it was a, a big opportunity because we uh, entered into the Barolo and Barbaresco market as premium and prime producers so for us was very very important and i'm very i'm very glad to, to start this kind of business particularly because i've i started officially my my business into the company in 2012 after, after my graduation and you know why you are 
very young and you want to do many experiences, uh, it's important to have the chance to, to get involved in a, in a new business as Barolo. It was fantastic and it is fantastic today too. But it was fantastic six years ago because uh, as a very young way maker, I had the chance to, to experiment, to make some new technologies, new ways, new aging into, into my wines. And that was very important for, for me, for my knowledge, for my, my skills uh, and for my growth too. So, so have you made... Um more changes um, since you were in your original family business, Luca Bossio Vineyards, or did you, were there more necessary changes and innovations to be made uh, when your family purchased Bella Cole? Uh I tell you, honestly, both. I mean, uh, I'm doing a lot of, uh, of changes in Bosio and all Bosio Panorama, which is uh, very, big with many layers of product. Uh, certainly, some innovation can be done in bell quality too, uh, but uh, under some different point of view, because as Barolo producer, we work in a very traditional way, and what is traditional cannot be changed at all. So uh, in bell what we are working is uh, doing different maturation, different uh, aging in wood in different period, trying to find the better uh, solution between period, uh, oak origin, uh, oak size, but without um, making real big changes. Mm -hmm. uh, what we did in Belcolle in the last years is introduced uh, for the first time uh, in organic management of the vineyards. So now we are uh, we have just introduced into the market some wines in uh, organic. Uh, not all production yet because having vineyards spread in different uh, different areas, uh, we cannot uh, make. Or, or make them more organic all at once. So we are doing step by step. But from uh, this year, we have the first wines organic. While about Bosio, uh, I, we, me and together with my winemaker teams, team, uh, we did many interesting uh, new wines, particularly connected with um, Moscato. Bosio is well known all around the world to be one of the most important uh, Moscato dusty producer. And in 2013, so just after my graduation, uh, we tried to, to create a new category, uh, making a real infusion of fruit inside the wine. So not flavoring the wine, but making infusion, which is um, maybe it could be very similar, but it's a really different concept. So we created a, a, this new category of the infused Moscato with different kinds of fruits from uh, starting from Brazil to Europe. Uh, we have passion fruit, we have mango, we have strawberry, but all of them are sourced in a specific area using traditional uh, varietal and in a fair trade markets. And all together, we, we built up a famous brand called the Tropical Moscato, uh, which is working very well in these years. And I think uh we, we we created inside the big category of flavored wine uh, a premium brand and and what um what countries is that do best for you in is it is it a uh, popular to people drink it in italy or is it more of an export wine for you it is surely more for export uh, just because in italy 
uh, we have this kind of uh, deep tradition of traditional wines. So everything uh, innovative on the wine, in the wine world is accepted, but takes time. While other countries more open to cocktails or to soft drinks, uh, surely accept well and much quicker than uh, than Italy. So actually, we are we are working very well with Tropical Moscato in, uh, in the United States. Then we are working well in all uh, Caribbean islands as well as Asia. So Asia, particularly South Korea, is uh, is working very well. Great. Yeah. So uh, let's taste some wine. Yes, let's taste some wine. Today, we have here six different wines among our uh, wide range of production uh, from Piedmont region. We selected some traditional ones uh, from white to red, uh, which cover practically all different sub-regions inside, inside Piedmont, from uh, Lange to Monferrato to Roero. So let's start as first one with Arnaise. This is the Lange Arnaise. Yes, that's one. This is a 2019 vintage. Arnaise, it's uh, a traditional grape from, uh, from Piedmont. Uh, it's particularly well known in Ro Roero, which is uh, one neighbor of Lange region. And uh, in the last years uh, from Roero, the cultivation of the Arnaise cultivation moved to Lange, particularly on upper hills uh, and on the cool sides of the of hills. How, uh, how important is this wine within your portfolio? Is is Arnais uh, an important grape for your family? Sorry, I, is, I is Arnais uh, is it an important grape for your family and your winery? Yes, because yes, exactly. And I think uh, Arnais uh, is really. Piedmont is in profile because it's uh, traditional, is luscious with a good, a good acidity. It does. I, I love the uh, the mouth feel and the texture. It's got it's got that acidity, but it also has good weight. Exactly, because it's not just acidity or unbalanced body. It's the acidity working together with the structure, with the shoulder, and uh, particularly the Arnais from Lange region uh, is cultivated in the same areas of great red wines. So obviously, even if the characters are really different, <laughs> uh, they share the same soil, the same weather condition, the same terroir. So surely it helps uh, to create a great white wine. Is this a grape that um, the vines produce a lot of? Is it low yield, high yield? No, uh, that's generally Piedmont. We don't have high yields. So when we get eight to 10 tons per hectare, it's already a big production. So. Uh, compared compared with uh, many other wine regions in the world, we have very low hills. Uh, this Arnais um, it's uh, it's grown in a young vineyard, so it's just ten to fifteen years. So still have to find its peak in uh, quality production ratio, but. A year per year uh, after year, so it's uh, it's growing fast. Well, that so that brings up a good question. Um, you know, you talked about it being relatively young. Yeah. How Arnais 
vines, do they go many decades or do they need to re be replanted after 40 or 50 years, assuming the vineyard's healthy? Uh, you know, there are two theories around uh, replanting a vineyard. Um, a school thinks that after 30, 40 years, a vineyard should be replanted. Another school thinks that it's better to replace just old vines or dead, dead vines without replanting all the vineyard. Honestly, I follow the second school. So we, this is a young vineyard, but just because we planted 15 years ago, but usually we don't replant a whole vineyard all at once. We just replace what, uh, what was necessary because it provides more complexity, more, uh, uh, the, the wines are already, are, are from immediately more approachable and uh, more mature. And I, I imagine you also keep more of a continuity that way, because if you're only replacing a handful of vines, it's not going to go from a, a, a wine that you've, you've been using older vines to all of a sudden brand new again. So you, you keep that consistency, I would imagine. Yes, exactly. It's, uh, um, we try to give uh, a consistent, not just quality, but experience to the wine lovers, wine drinkers. So uh, if you are used to work with vineyards and vines, which are uh, 30 or 40 years old, and then the um, following vintage, you start with the very young uh, vines, the wines is totally different. And then uh, you have to, if you replaced all at once a big vineyard, you have to stop production for a couple of years. Yeah, yeah, and that's obviously rough on the, for you in the marketplace. Yes, exactly. Particularly if we, if we are talking about the most famous vineyards. So usually with the most important vineyards, everybody has a small plot. And if you replace for at least five, six, seven years, you will not, you will not have available that uh, premium crew. So has our, um, our niece always been part of the portfolio as long as uh, Luca Basio Vineyards has existed? Yes, exactly. Langarnais was one of my first uh, challenge because um, uh, before uh, 20, uh, yeah, 2010, we've, we, we've never been producing Arnaise. And so we started with, uh, with Arnaise 10, 11 years ago with this vineyard of uh, 15 years old. And now we, we have uh, both us as we make her and uh, the vineyard good maturity <laughs> to, to be ready to produce great wine. Great. So uh, we move on to uh, Barbera next? Yes. Let's do the Barbera as next. This Barbera is from Asti region, and this is from Belcolle Winery. And this is the first wine that from this year will be organic. So, uh, and that's a, that's a new label as well, right? Yes, exactly. That's a new label with a big uh, tree of life. <laughs> Yeah. And this particularly is 17 as vintage. Uh, the new vintage 19, which is will be released next summer, will be organic. Uh, this Barbera uh, is called Nuanda, uh, as the you know from the movie The Dead Boys Society, because uh, uh, it's a way with, I decided to make this kind of wine inside a very traditional winery as Belcolle in a totally different way. So this is a five acres uh, vineyard. 
inside these five acres, we just produce 10 tons of grapes. So very low, low yield, but they are naturally uh, managed. So, I mean, we, we don't, uh, we, uh, the production is natural in this way. So uh, it's very low because uh, in particular terroir where the, this vineyard is located. Then uh, the fermentation is, uh, takes place with indigenous yeast in wood barrels and then spend all the age period in uh, a blend of old and new barrels of uh, different sizes. So we try to match tradition and innovation. Tradition because of the winery, Belcolle, and innovation because of the wine style. Uh, do you uh, do you, do you uh, blend it after it's been in the in the different size barrels, or it's already one master blend and then it goes to different size uh, barrels? Uh, fermentation and malolactic fermentation takes place in the same barrel size. So they are the oaks, barrel oaks of 5,000 liters each. Then we divide the wines into different kinds of barrels from different uh, producers, different size, different oak uh, provenience. So from France uh, to uh, Slovenia to some uh, California too. So it's a blend. Even to uh, at the beginning, I decided to work in this way because I didn't know very well this vineyard, which was not planted by my family, but was bought from a local family. And I didn't know almost anything about it. And so I, I thought, let's understand which kind of wood, which size works better for, for this wine. And then for the following vintage, uh, we will choose the one which works better. Then uh, while blending, I understood that uh, all these different sizes of, uh, of oak and different uh, regions of, uh, of the wood created a great blend all together. So since then, since the first vintage, we, we worked in this way. So blending different kinds of size and different kinds of wood. It's a, it's a very tasty Barbera, and I can see what you're saying about marrying tradition and, and modern, uh, because it's got that um, some forward fruit that brings to mind the new world a little bit and sort of that way of thinking, but it's not, it's not a big Barbera by any means. It, it comes at you a little bit, and then it sort of settles into a very proportionate wine. Yes, correct, because uh, I, uh, I don't want... Uh, and usually I'm used to to produce wines that I love and I love to drink so um, the um, to uh, international wines are not for me to traditional wines are not for me I think that every wine has to, to be vinified and respected for what it is. So we, uh, uh, my school is not traditional or modern, is not European or international, is more respective of the single wine and single vineyard. We are very lucky to live in a wonderful place with wonderful vineyards with a great history. So uh, we have to, firstly, to respect what we have and uh, trying to make some innovation. That's, that's for sure, because innovation is what uh, jump us in the future. Yeah, that's the only way to move forward. Yes, but always remember our roots. So is, this one, is the Barbera one of the wines that you've made the most changes to since uh, you guys took over Belcale? Yes, exactly. <laughs> it is.
And you, you understood from uh, my, maybe from my description that I'm very connected with this wine. Yeah, I can see your passion for it. Yeah, I'm very passionate for this wine, yeah. So we move over to Barbaresco next? Yes, exactly. We move to Barbaresco, always from Belcolle Winery. This is a Barbaresco from a famous single vineyard, a famous crew called Pajore. Pajore is uh, uh, very famous to be in uh, the vineyard where uh, the iconic wines from uh, Sito Moresco were created in the past. Now these wines are uh, are so hard to be found that uh, if somebody has a bottle of their of his wine into the cellar, keep it because <laughs> it's one of the last in the world. And we bought uh, one hectare of vineyard uh, in 2015. So the first vintage was 2015, and it's very nice, and you can feel the real uh, potential of Barbaresco uh, as is known to be the, in Piedmont we call it, the queen of the wine, while the, the Barolo is the king of the wine. This just because Barbaresco is works more on the elegant size, on the fineness, on the, is more approachable usually, but it's very different from vineyard to vineyard. Even if the production area of Barbaresco is very small, uh, if you compare with, uh, with Barolo, the difference between one vineyard to the next one or once one uh, exposure to, the, to another one is, is amazing because wines are, will be totally different. And this Barbaresco, it's, I think, uh, a middle way between uh, powerful yet elegant wine. So if, even if it's uh, has a big shoulder, uh, but, you know, a great uh, heritage of, of tannins uh, and a huge uh, age potential, is approachable. So uh, you can drink it now, even if it's very young, but you can hold for in your wine cellar for several years. So, yeah, so we're tasting this Barbaresco and yeah, you use the word elegant and that, that is the first word I thought of. It's also um, incredibly aromatic and you also use the word big, but it's the bigness here to me is really in um, its persistence. It just has an incredibly long finish and yeah, it's got tannin, but it's not, um, I, I don't know, it's, a, it's very approachable right now. I, I'm, it, it's impressive for its youth. Yes, it's approachable because this is the new way we are trying to, to produce Barbaresco and Barolo as well. So trying to do extraction during vinification of just the tannins that are useful. So not all the tannins inside the, the skin and inside the seeds, but just what we need. So uh, without uh, entering inside chemical point of view, uh, what is important to give age worth and, uh, and get it drinkable now is have a good quantity of tannins, but not too dry, not too reactive with our mouth. And that's very important. And with... Uh, specific vinification with uh, very quick and very precise vinification, we can do it. So without being uh, too innovative, without changing tradition, we can bring tradition into the future. So we can create great wines that will be great into the next 20, 30 years, but already approachable now. 
And that was in the past the probably the biggest issue, the biggest claim about the Bavarian Barbaresco. Very good uh, in the future, but not drinkable now because too rough, too dry. Mm, that was a problem. And uh, I mean, that was important, not an important aspect because being very rough in, uh, while young means you, <laughs> you will get a long life into, into the cellar. But uh, a dear friend of mine told me that uh, what is important when you buy a bottle of wine is that you have to be available to enjoy now this evening for dinner, not in 30 years. If I want to keep in my cellar for 30 years, it's important and it's right. And you have to give all the um, chance to the wine to, to be ready to, to stay 30 years in the, in the cellar. But if I want to drink it now this evening, I have to drink it. So this was a great lesson for me. Uh, this friend of mine is an importer. So uh, a man working every day with, uh, from one side with the winery, from the other side with customers uh, was a great lesson for me because I understood that if uh, something I had to change, I had to change our mentality to understand that we have to, to get our clients, our customers satisfied both now and in the future. And, and do you think this is a, a change that is uh, going on in Italy across the board or um, only a small amount of producers are making these kind of changes? No, I think that um, there are some some producers uh, that are um, that work in the same way they have been working for the last four years, um, and they produce great wines. That's for sure. Then there are some others that use a lot of technology, a lot of knowledge in uh, biology and chemistry and whatever, and produce great wines, but maybe too far away from tradition and from Piedmont. And then there are all the others that work with uh, heart, mind, and uh, knowledge. So try to connect everything together. Yeah, it sounds like you're working with all the available tools that you have in front of you. You, you want to use the best of the old and the, and, and the new. Exactly. So uh, I, I work personally in a very traditional way. In a very, I, I try to respect my tradition. I try to respect what uh, our grandfathers made in the past because if now we are here discussing about Barone Barbaresco is because in the past somebody made a very good job otherwise <laughs> uh, yeah. the, the big uh, uh, Barolo and Barbaresco uh, appellations probably could never exist so I, I respect what they did I just try to um, take their tradition, their, their knowledge, and put here now in 2020. Makes sense. Yep. Now we, we try some Barolo. Yes. So let's start with the Barolo from Luca Bosi Vineyards. So this is the Barolo from uh, different different vineyards spread in uh, in Barolo area. Most of them are in uh, La Morra, Novello, and a small part in Barduno. And uh, again, you feel tradition, innovation blended together. It's not just a blend of vineyard, not just a blend of different vinification, um, whatever. 
it's a real real blend of mentality so trying to put together what i i learned at school what i learned in my life and what my grandparents teach me So I'm sorry, how many vineyards did you say you sourced the fruit for this wine from? This, uh, we blend together around 10 different vineyards. Different vineyards uh, with separate vinification. So separate picking, separate vinification. Then separate aging. Just at the end of three years, we blend together. So uh always trying to provide uh, a consistent uh, profile into the wine uh, to get it uh, recognizable as this is the Barolo from Luca Bosio. So I know I'm drinking this kind of wine. So recognizable and always thank to uh, the vineyards we have in La Mora, Novello, and Verduno, so the west part of, northwest part of Barolo area, they have, they are really recognizable because they are more on the elegant style, so they remind you maybe more Barbaresco than the big stuff from uh, Serra Lunga, because Serra Lunga or Castiglione Falletto, uh, because um, it's a specific sub area where the climate is uh, cooler. Uh, there is a, a river, a big river that provides uh, cool air, cool nights. And so the profile is very precise and very e and easy to, to recognize. Well, uh, what I love about this Barolo is there's a the, you know, great aromas, but there's a there's a minerality on the finish, which really speaks to me. Yes, that's probably come from the soil, because um, it's a um, it's a blend of soils, but uh, with the predominance of um, sandy of sand nodes, sand soils. So they are very uh, suitable for making the biolo. But these lands are very suitable for making great Barbera, or great Dolcetto, or great white wines. So uh, they provide um, a good balance between all the elements and this minerality, which is uh, together with the aromatic notes are um, exactly from that area of, of, of uh, Barrow region. And again, it's um, it's incredibly approachable, and it it has um, you know great finish, nice acid. It's really drinkable today, but it's going to last for quite a while, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's our aim. That's our goal to for for the future. So drink it now or keep it in the cellar, and you will get in 10, 15 years. Terrific. And now we've got uh, another Barolo. Yes, this is another Barolo. It's Barolo from, it's one of the Barolo from the Colle Winery we produce. This is called Symposio, which comes from the Latin, it means symposium. So a blend of, again, different vineyards. The, the, the main difference between Luca Bosio Barolo and Bel Colle Barolo Symposio is that these are several vineyards, but all located in Tio Verduno. So they are from the same hill. And um, you, you know that Piedmont and particularly Barolo and Barbaresco are well known to be one of the first uh, Italian wine region to get recognized the single vineyard, and you can put on the label the single vineyard, as we do for the Barbaresco, Pajore. And But I really love make the blends. So uh, we produce single vineyard, 
uh, we're producing Rovigno Barbaresco and Barolo II from uh, the famous uh, crew Monbillero. But then I really love uh, the, when, when we do some blends. That's amazing because making blends, it's uh, probably the aspect that I love more about when making. Because you like, you like assembling that cuvee and, and coming up with the, the, the best version of what you've got in front of you? Exactly. So if uh, I work with Barolo Monvillero or from, from Barbaresco Paiore, they are wonderful vineyards. So we try to get the best from the grape we have. But then a second, uh, a second kind of, uh, of uh, vinification I really love is make the opposite. So let's try to get the best from each vineyard, but then try to blend together. And uh, many times in, you, you can get very good wines from blending much better than from single vineyard. And this is a practice that was very common in the past. Now it's uh, less famous, but just because single vineyard are getting more and more uh, space into, into the uh, wine region productions. Uh, but I think that it's important to keep this tradition alive in, uh, in Piedmont too. You know, com comparative to the Basio Brolo, this one is a, a, a bit, uh, leans towards a dark, darker fruit, it seems, a little bit bigger shoulders, a bit more leathery, less minerally than the other one. Uh, does that sound right? Yes, this is the real characteristic of uh, Barolo from Barduno. So all the notes you, you explained are very close to Pella Verga. So if you have the chance to taste the Pella Verga, maybe not a young, young vintage, some older, you will feel many, uh, many aspects, many flavors very close to this Barolo because uh, the grapes are important, but the lens is very important too. So in a biolo planted in Verduno provides specific and very recognizable uh, flavor profile. And this particularly is blend of 10 different vineyards, uh, all from, uh, as I told you, all from Verduno. So 10 different vineyards. Some years are just six, some years could be 12, depends. And, and same methodology, I assume, as the Basio, where you uh, vinify and do everything and then blend it, blend before yeah. bottling? Yes, correct. Uh, there are, there is just one difference, uh, is that we made the blend uh, after two years. So the wine blended, spend other eight, 10 months, uh, uh, in wood barrels. So we do the blend the, the summer before uh, the, we, we bottle, just to, you know, to, to blend a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And usually the last six to 10 months are spent into very old and big barrel size. Yeah, it's a, another lovely Barolo, incredibly distinct. They're, they're quite different from each other, as, as they should be. Mm. Uh, really nice. Oh, thank you. And now we uh, finish with the Moscato. Yes, we finish with the last one, with the Moscato d'Asti, which is, again, a wine I'm very in love with because my family... Uh, was born producing just Moscato d'Asti. Uh, we, we've been uh, in the Moscato business for more than 40 years. 
And, uh, you know, Moscato is uh, uh, easy to drink wine. So it's approachable, it's fruity, it's sweet, it's naturally sweet. So several times people drink it, you know, very easy. But uh, I think that Moscato is one of the most complex wine in the, in the world because it has such a big uh, array of flavors mm, from fruity to flower to flowery notes and then getting older it changed it uh, there is a big modification into the profile providing completely different uh, flavors so it's a uh, it's a wine that uh, could could give you many new experience every time you taste it what it's a it's an interesting grape and i think also um that you know there's um probably some misconception about it amongst uh, certain wine consumers because there are examples out there that are, yeah this is sweet but it's not syrupy sweet um there are certain examples out there that are they're just basically sugar and this is a more traditional moscato di Asti, right yes but uh, there are some important key point about moscato tasty is that and several times this is a discussion i have with customers during wine dinners or tasting the sweetness is natural so there is not added sugar inside these sugars come from the first fermentation the fermentation then is stopped with cold temperature and so what you taste is exactly uh, the sugar from the grapes as well as for the bubbly no, the, the, the bubbles they are from the fermentation they are not added so that's uh, it's a um, communication problem Moscato Dusty have and I'm always repeat and repeat and repeat this this things about so natural sweetness natural bubbles and then there are different styles so uh, there are, we have we are many producers in Moscato world so some works more on concentrations some more work more on um, um, sugar syrupy notes so more like honey or a mm, ripe apricot and honestly i prefer working in this way so uh, freshness herbal notes uh, uh, mm, sweetness but not over the sweet so that's the way i like moscato and i um, I produce Moscato, but there are different production way according to many, many factors from vineyard to uh, uh, production way into the vinification. So th there are many aspects, but that's the way I really like to, to do it. So work on freshness and not on sweetness. Yeah, and, and freshness is really uh, tasting this. That's the first thing that hit me is how fresh it is. It's got that sweetness there, but it's so fresh and has nice acidity. You can go back and keep drinking it. And uh, my palate doesn't get tired drinking it, which the ones that are too sweet, in my opinion, my mouth gets exhausted pretty quickly. Me too. After one day, I said, no, I, st I, I quit. While we, if you, you, you can balance well the acidity together with the sweetness, you can create a very good wine and you can keep on drinking even because it's very low in alcohol. So uh, it's easier and approachable for, uh, for that reason too. Yeah, this is really lovely. Mm. Well, Luca, thank you so much. Thank you for your time and, to, and for sharing with me this good experience. So for me, it was a real pleasure. Same. I, I look forward to uh, things, you know, getting back to normal, and maybe we can uh, share a glass of wine in person one of these days before too long. Wine in front of each other, yes. <laughs> not, not in front of a computer. <laughs>